Great. Well, good evening. And um, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, tonight, I'm delighted to have S Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman um, here to present his book. We're, we've been very privileged in the Blavatnik School of Government to have benefited from Laurie's advice and wisdom from right early on in the birth of the school and now as one of our treasured visiting professors in the school, um, the st st some of you who are students in the school will get to, to study with him later on in the year. Um, many of you will know that, that Laurie Friedman is often described as the Dean of Security Studies in, in, in Britain. He was the head of the War Studies Department at King's College London. I looked at the years and I couldn't believe it. 19, from 1982 to 1997, now, that's the equivalent of five marathons <laughs> for the runners among you. Um, but you really established, you know, war studies and security studies in this country, uh, Laurie, having done a, a doctorate here at Nuffield um, not so many years ago. Um, more recent, he has, as you know, a prodigious set of extraordinarily readable books. Uh, Strategy, a history, which you've discussed here in the school. Um, I, I was amazed at how many books you've actually published. I thought I'd read, you know, some of yours. Um, but tonight's book, uh, The Future of War, is a, a particularly special contribution from a man who is known in, by the British public as having sat as um, one of the um, genuine public servants on the Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq war. And what Laurie Friedman brought to the Chilcot inquiry, which required John Chilcott and, 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 and Laurie Friedman to really invest so many years of your life, 2009 till 2016. And, you know, I was reflecting today on how the, the tests for going to war that Laurie Friedman drew up many years ago, people at, at, at call it the beginnings of the Blair Doctrine at the time, you know, you might... Uh, um, not approve of that subsequent, given what happened subsequently. But those five tests, which are really basic tests, you know, are we sure of our case for going to war? Have we exhausted the diplomatic means? Can we do it? Are we prepared to stay in for the long term? Are our national interests at stake? Five really great tests for going to war. And it, it dawned on me as I reread that, that they structured the Chilcot Report, and that's what makes it a very powerful investigation into why this country went to war in Iraq and what was wrong with that decision to go to war in Iraq. So, uh, sorry for the long introduction, but Laurie Friedman is somebody who has dedicated a life to thinking about war and then to really trying to help government after government, conservative governments, labor governments alike, to think their way through what this country should do when faced with decisions to go to war. And as such, he brings a really rare, deep perspective to his subject, the future of war. So I'm going to ask you to warmly welcome him. <laughs> Given that many of you have just purchased the book outside, I'm going to, I've asked um, Professor Friedman to just outline um, the case he makes in his book quite briefly, so that we can then have plenty of opportunity for you to put your questions to him and interrogate what he has to say. So, Laurie. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thanks very much for that very kind introduction, and thank you uh, for coming, especially those who've already bought the book, and I hope after what I have to say now, you won't want to take it back. Uh, so, the, this is one of those books where the subtitle is really quite important, um, the Future of War, A History. Uh, it started off as the future of war. That was what I was originally going to write. And I decided uh, for the first chapter just to do, look at the history uh, because people had tried this before and I thought it would be interesting to see how they did it and whether it had worked and uh, what guidance that gave for my own efforts. But the more I looked at it, A, just how rich the literature was on the future of war, how many books had been written with that as a title um, uh, uh, or, or that as a theme. Uh, secondly, how rarely they'd got it right. 
and therefore raising the question, why was I about to set myself up for another failure uh, in this long list of attempts to predict the future which never seemed to go right. But also, actually, it wasn't so much about the ability to predict. What the history of the future of war told you was about the expectations uh, the issues, the challenges that were faced at the time these books were written. They, they weren't actually predictive, by and large, they were prescriptive. They, they were about, uh, essentially, things that we need to do in order to avoid uh, this terrible fate that I described to you in the, in the coming pages in the book. So that was the basic um, uh, starting point, that there's a long tradition of writing books about the future to spur us into current action, either to push peace or to buy particularly military uh, pieces of military equipment uh, or to, to take another step to, to ward off dangers. Um, just to give you some example of the range uh, uh, of this, I, I mean, I start off with a book some of you may have heard of uh, called The Battle of Dorking that was written uh, in 1871. Uh, after the Franco-Prussian War, which imagines how the Germans are going to invade uh, Britain, um, how they managed to get past the real difficulty with any invasion, which is the channel, uh, but they, that, that's almost by the by, because the real interest is in the lack of preparedness of the army and the need for reform of the army. So when this last battle comes, uh, slightly bizarrely for those of, the, of you who know uh, the home counties, when, when this comes in Dorking, uh, we, we fight valiantly but inevitably are beaten and, and uh, centuries of progress and accumulated assets are lost uh, because we just haven't got the army sorted out in time. Um, fast forward to this year and there's a book um, some of you may have read called The Thucydides Trap by, by Graham Allison, um, Dean or former dean at the Belfast Centre in, in Harvard, which talks about the likelihood of a war between the United States and China, uh, describes all the reasons why it may happen, but then provides a reason why it might not happen, that is, the policy recommendations which he brings to this subject. And Alison, um, in 2004, um, had written another book uh, on nuclear terrorism, describing it as highly likely, almost inevitable in the coming decades, or it might have happened by now, um, were it, unless people followed the very sensible and wise recommendations with which he concluded his book. So it's a, it's a device, uh, and, a, and a long-standing device, for explaining the future, uh, expl explaining what needs to be done to prepare for the future, rather than being predictive. So that's the spirit with which it's written. The book's divided into three parts. Uh, the first part is the most straightforward, in a way. It is the part that takes us from around the middle of the 19th century to the end of the Cold War. It's when there's a continual focus on great power conflict and when the, um, uh, the, the challenges of great power conflict uh, look more and more dire. It starts with the assumption uh, of the 1870s uh, that battle would be decisive, that war could be contained, uh, and that this was a matter for armies to sort out, and, and the politicians um, would set who the enemy was and decide on the peace settlement. But what happened in between was very much a military business. It depended on the idea of decisive battle. Then all of that was thrown up in the air as a result of the First World War. And then looking forward, it was the possibility of a war starting with uh, massive air raids based on the rather flimsy evidence of what had happened uh, with the Zeppelin and air raids during the First World War. Um, flimsy because nothing in their air raids suggested that the population would... would go crazy and panic. But that was the assumption that you see in much of the interwar literature about the likely start uh, of a coming war. It would start with, with the air raids and the people would panic and the civilians would demand that their government uh, abandon 
abandon the war. Uh, of course, it didn't. It sort of eventually worked out like that, and that there were massive air raids. But the war didn't start as anticipated. Indeed, in some ways, it started as people had expected the First World War uh, to be in, in 1914. When, when it did get going, uh, the Blitzkrieg uh, mirrored uh, what uh, Germany might have hoped to achieve with the Schlieffen Plan then. But of course, the ending of the um, of the Second World War with the atomic bombs uh, heralded uh, yet a new and even more dire prospect than those of mass air raids, which is the complete obliteration of civilizations. And you have uh, from 1945, developing from 1945 up to, uh, right up to the end of the Cold War, a literature which is dominated by this dystopian uh, prospect of, uh, of a nuclear catastrophe. Uh, and I, all the way through, I try to look at some of the literature about the future, and that you see, um, say, in books like uh, Neville Shoots on the Beach, uh, or even movies like Dr. Strangelove, um, almost a sense of hopelessness, things out of control. I mean, on the beach is not really... I mean, there's some interesting stuff about why Shoot thinks a war might have started. Um, but the, the story is about actually how humans cope with, with this uh, complete uh, uh, calamity. By the time you get to the end of the Cold War, uh, there's much more newer, nuanced appreciations of what a future war might look like, say in John Hackett's book The Third World War on the novels of Tom Clancy. Um, and then all of a sudden it ends. There's, there's sort of lots of stuff on surprise attacks, but nothing on surprise pieces. Uh, so we have a surprise piece in 1989-90, um, and then a whole genre of literature, a whole uh, academic endeavour suddenly comes to a grinding halt. And that leads to the, and there's sort of a, a slight shift in, in emphasis in the book because there isn't a literature that is, not, is there ready to tell us how to cope with the sort of challenges that we face in the 1990s about how, how to intervene, how to intervene effectively. The, the literature left over from Vietnam is, is very gloomy and basically tells you that this is a damaging thing to do. Uh, so don't do it. Uh, there's no guidance on how to do it if you think it's become important. Um, the academic literature, uh, there's a lot of literature on revolutions. Academics write a lot about revolutions because they sort of approve of them. Um, but there's not a lot about civil wars. There's very little literature about civil wars prior to 1990. After 1990, there's masses, absolutely masses, and a lot of it very good indeed. Um, but it's, it's always a bit behind the curve, and that was sort of is what the second third of the book is about. It's, it's about uh, catching up with events, trying to understand. So by the time we do sort of understand how it is that... Um, uh, Civil wars do develop, the challenges that are faced when you do intervene, and we sort of understand it a bit better what to do. We've got ourselves in complete messes in Iraq and Afghanistan and are sort of stuck with them, and the appetite for this sort of intervention has drained away. So that's the second third of the book. It's about um, the, the challenges of understanding uh, and the challenge that poses to the academic community, the challenge of understanding um, the most regular sort of warfare, the most frequent sort of warfare. Uh, it's not uh, the great power conflicts or even interstate war um, at all. I mean, they happen, but they're quite rare. It's the sort of grinding, continual civil wars, particularly of the sort that we see in sub-Saharan Africa, um, which are incredibly hard to stop. Uh, and if, when, if we don't intervene, um, or if the intervene is, is partial and marginal, or if the intervention, as so often happens in Africa, uh, is done by neighbours with their own interests in how the conflict should develop, they don't stop. They may have pauses, they may have moments when, they're trying, when both sides, or many sides, are trying to recover, but they keep on going. And that's in part also because economic stakes develop in these wars. They're, for those uh, at one level, they're quite profitable. And then that leads into the third 
part of the book, which is trying to pick up the debates that developed out of the experience of counterinsurgency, but also those that have developed as a result of some of the debates you'll be familiar with about contemporary warfare, um, uh, hybrid warfare as supposedly practiced by the Russians in Ukraine, cyber warfare uh, supposedly practiced by the Russians in the United States, um, uh, the future of autonomous vehicles, drone warfare, trying to look at the, at the more futuristic um, side of, uh, of the equation, uh, which almost takes us back to the sort of issues that be, were common in the first, for the period up to 1990s. It's almost picking up where that left, uh, left off, uh, but with China now settled upon as the most likely uh, source of uh, challenge for the United States uh, after having gone through a number of potential contenders uh, from uh, Japan uh, and even at one point to revive Germany. But again, those of you who watch this literature may recall uh, books with titles like The Coming War with Japan that were current in the early 1990s. Uh, and like so many of these books uh, that, that are telling you how things are going to develop um, they come out just as Japan was entering its long period of stagnation uh, and was in, uh, uh, even if the underlying premise had any validity uh, in the late 80s. It certainly had very little by the early 90s. But China is a different matter. Um, uh, towards the end, obviously, I, 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 I look forward a bit myself, but cautiously. Um, one, one of the patterns that, that, that strikes me all the way through, uh, the two, two things, so just to end on and perhaps serve as some basis for discussion. One, the preoccupation with surprise attack and knockout blow. It's not surprising. If you're going to start a war, um, if, you, if you think a war is inevitable and you might as well start it, then the way to start it is, uh, by taking the initiative, is to, is to maximize surprise. It makes perfect sense. Uh, and in, the 18, in 1870, when Prussia took on France, the, the Prussians were surprised by the fact that the French, having declared war, took so long to mobilize, whereas the Germans just got on with it. Uh, in 1914, mobilization, as we know, was critical to um, uh, the dynamics of the crisis, which, which meant that a war that might have been avoidable began when it did. During the Second World War, the Japanese and the Germans, despite not having defeated the enemies with which they started, um, decided uh, that war was going to come with an even bigger enemy, Russia in the case of Germany, the United States in the case of Japan. And in 1941, they both tried surprise attacks in order to beat them. Uh, Operation Barbarossa in June 1941, Pearl Harbor in December. Uh, both of them achieved some degree of tactical success. Both of them strategically were catastrophic failures and ended up uh, with the crushing uh, of the perpetrators. Yet the idea of surprise attack never quite went away. It hadn't succeeded against the United States, but the fact that somebody had tried lived on. So that you see... Uh, in the nuclear age, the idea of a nuclear first strike very much capturing the idea that if you're going to go to war, then you, the only way to do it, in this case with incredibly demanding uh, operational challenge, would be by first strike. Interestingly, uh, the, the chap who did most to develop this notion of the possibility of a first strike, Albert Wollstetter, his wife Roberta, had written an extremely well-regarded and noticed book on Pearl Harbor. Um, the idea of surprise attack was obviously discussed quite a bit in the Wollstetter household. Um, so, and when you get even to cyber, people talk about an electronic Pearl Harbor uh, and focus on the worst possible event, which would be uh, sort of the plug going out on critical infrastructure and... Uh, air traffic control, the banking system, everything falling apart. Um, whereas 
uh, in practice, cyber is, is, is a real issue, but not in that way. It's a regular feature of all sorts of conflict, including the criminal. The second um, thing that, that struck me is the difficulty when talking about war, um, about civilians, about the extent to which civilians get caught up in conflict. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a recurring theme. Uh, it's obviously important when you get round to talking about uh, civil wars. Uh, clearly, civilians are the main victims of those. But even in the, in the 19th century, when, um, according to the theory, there was a sharp distinction between combatants and non-combatants, uh, the issue was then, just to highlight one linkage which interested me, um, the end of the Civil War, American Civil War, with Sherman's march on, um, on Georgia, which was influenced in part by his experience in fighting the Indians, uh, the Native Americans, because um, uh, of making life miserable for them and therefore encouraging them to be more compliant. Um, the success of that was used by Civil War General Philip Sheridan, who happened to be in Berlin in, eight, in, in 1870, when Bismarck was first trying to work out how to deal with French resistance uh, after they would got rid uh, of Napoleon III because of his defeat at Sedan. This idea of civilian resistance um, and the need to make life miserable for the civilians if you are going to overcome it uh, has a long history and it continues to influence strategic practice. Just to give an example recently, Sri Lanka and the Tamils. Yet, it doesn't fit easily into uh, a lot, either, certainly not the textbooks or the international law, but even a lot of the analysis of how wars are conducted. Um, the final point to make is, um, I think it's a useful exercise to ask questions about the future. Uh, the line of Eisenhower, uh, plans are useless, planning is essential, uh, I think is true with a lot of things. Thinking about these issues forces you to ask questions, which is what you need to do if you're thinking about war. What I hope the book does is demonstrate um, the, the, the optimism with which uh, war plans are often put together is rarely warranted. Um, the, 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 there's an awful lot of thinking about the first blows, but very little often about the second and third, let alone those way down the line, when instead of uh, decisive victories, uh, you're in a long slog of attrition. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a warning to think through what you're trying to do, and a warning about not relying too much on your predictions. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Laurie. Why don't you, do you, do you want to stay? Your questions, comments. Yeah. Um, thank you. May I ask you a question? If we put you on the spot, do you think that there would be a war in the next 20 years, a major conflict? A major conflict? Do I, I say that sort of in, you know, in the light of, if you look at Norman Angel's book, doesn't it? Before Norman Angel, yes. The, 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 um... you know, he said war was impossible because it was too expensive. Well, he denied he'd said it was impossible. He said he thought it was very unwise um, and improbable. Uh, this was a book that came out just before the First World War, um, which uh, made the very good point that the, the economic interdependence meant that um, the economies of the belligerent would suffer greatly in the event of war, and so it proved to be the case. Unfortunately, now the businessman nor financiers were consulted in July 1914. Um, and so uh, his book didn't work. But it's, it, it's always cited, uh, it's called The Great Illusion, the book. It, uh, the Great Illusion was, was a great war. Uh, it's always cited as an example of the dangers of making confident predictions. And it's been followed by others. Um, uh, normally they're books which... Um, demonstrate how foolish war is and how they're not going to happen. So Martin von Krefel produced a book on the transformation of war, which came out in the 1990s, saying how there wasn't going to be more interstate wars. 
just be, uh, as um, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Uh, and because Stephen Pinker uh, in 2011 brought out this book showing that war was in terminal decline, or certainly in great decline in terms of the incidence of war and the casualties, just as an upturn developed in the, uh, in the number of wars and their casualties. In Syria doesn't appear in his book. So um, that's the way it normally works, is people uh, saying there isn't going to be a war and one turns up. Um, but Laurie, can, can, yeah, can, I, can I add to that question? Because it's a question I'm sure you're asked even more than I'm asked, which is people look at, look at this part of the world and say, but also other parts of the world, and say suddenly nationalism is on the rise, suddenly there are leaders in charge of even some quite large states who seem less measured in their approach to other countries. Are we heading towards war? Are our children going to go to war? Yeah, and, and the answer is I don't know. But, the, but if you look at, you know, there's a war going on in Europe at the moment, in Ukraine. Um, I mean, people die on, on a pretty regular basis there. It's not uh, Syria levels, but it's pretty bad. Um, and it's not over, and, and nobody quite knows. I mean, it, it, it's sputtering, but it's not over. Nobody quite knows how to bring it to an end. And one can imagine uh, actions that might be taken um, by either side um, that could lead it to escalate. I, I mean, I'm, I, wouldn't, I don't expect that, but it's possible. Well, you know, we're looking at the moment at a developing clash but, uh, involving North Korea who declares war. I mean, Kim Jong-un regularly declares war on his neighbours. I mean, it happens so regularly, people tend to discount it. Um, you know, it's sort of an old Stalinist problem that if you use all your vituperation up uh, on a routine basis, when you're really cross, you haven't got a way of showing it. But, but, but North Korea is, in, is, is quite belligerent, developing nuclear weapons, and it's facing a US administration, which, to say the least, uh, is unclear about its intentions, blowing hot one day, a little colder the next. But it's not impossible to work out a scenario where it can happen. So rather than saying, you know, yes, there will definitely be war, I don't think there definitely will be a war, but there are risks of war. It's a, it's a probability question, and it's not zero. It's not zero. But do there, I guess part of the question is, you know, as the person in Britain who thinks more about this than anyone else, do those risks feel to you as though they're increasing? Or, or is this just every year everybody thinks there are risks? I think, I think you know, there, there, there are moods in, uh, in international affairs, and, and we're going through one at the moment. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's quite a dark period. Um, that partly depends, I think, on the way the international economy goes. I think it does depend on that. I think what, what happened was that the optimism of the 1990s, the sort of liberal, uh, the spread of liberalism and liberal democracy, and the idea uh, that that by itself would bring peace, uh, has been lost. So that so the, the optimism that we have a way round this isn't there anymore. Um, and that China in particular, um, more so than any other country, you may have others in mind, has shown that authoritarian states can be economically successful, which wasn't supposed to be the case. Um, so nationalism and authoritarianism have had a boost um, and a loss of confidence in, in, in liberal capitalism is part of that. So whether the, how much that feeds through into conflict is, is less clear. Um, it feeds through in the sense that in the Middle East and Africa um, you have these wars that keep on going on and nobody is very good at stopping them. But whether that leads to the sort of uh, World War Three type uh, conflict is less clear. I, I, mean, I think it's still that, that is amongst the most unlikely. The reason for that is there are still nuclear weapons around and every time you stop thinking about a war like that, mushroom clouds start to appear and that can make anybody cautious. So, uh, you know, my, you know, we've gone on far longer without a major war than people assumed in the past. Uh, how long this will carry on, uh, it, I'm, I'm not going to... It would be go against the spirit of my book to predict. Um, but um, 
the risks, I think, are, are, are certainly feel greater now. Um, and you know, we don't have the advantage of the calm, assured leadership um, that we might have had at previous times. Great. Other questions? Yeah. It's quite common. It seems quite common nowadays to describe the war as more complex than it's been before and therefore that future events are more uncertain than perhaps they've been in the past. Is that warranted? And perhaps in your review of the, the history of the future of war, have you seen that there have been times where it's been warranted to have a greater sense of certainty about what the future holds? Yeah, I think well, every generation worries that it might be on the verge of some great discontinuity and everything's going to come apart. I mean, certainly if you read a lot of the interwar literature, H.G. Wells, Shape of Things to Come or, or whatever, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's not relaxing, uh, it's not reassuring. What I think is the case is they had a clearer framework. The framework was much more contained as to, um, as to how a major conflict would come about because there weren't that many states. You know, you, you, you weren't talking about that many big players. When the United, even when the United Nations was formed, what, about 60 states, there's now 190. So there are many more players. And within those states, because a lot of them are, are quite fragile, um, you've got militias and secessionists and, and various groups. So there's a fragmentation of political action uh, combined with uh, ability to get hold of violent means uh, that means that there's a lot more potential for conflict that's not under anybody's control. Um, but this, so in that sense, it is more complex uh, and it is more uncertain. Things like Al Qaeda, things like 9 11, would have been hard to imagine in the past, um, just simply because. The, not because there weren't uh, uh, people who wanted to cause mayhem. Um, again, read Conrad's The Secret Agent, which has a character called The Professor, which is a name that's come back into vogue in, uh, over the last week, um, uh, who um, is a walking bomb. So you have, but, but he's not a walking bomb that can bring down uh, massive buildings. So. Uh, in that sense, I mean, it, it is more uncertain uh, and more complex. Lastly, you've got this blurring of war and peace, um, blurring of civil and military. What's political, what's criminal, what's ideological, what's religious, what's cynical? It's much harder to be, uh, to be sure. So the sort of models of international politics of the 19th century that lasted well into the 20th just don't seem to work anymore. And I think that does add to the... Complexity. Great. Question down here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sir Lawrence, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I ask you the notion or the concept of just war? Is this any longer applicable? I know you didn't mention it in your, in, 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 in your talk earlier. I'm not sure if it's covered. But is the St. Augustine's uh, notion of just war is no longer applicable? Uh, I mean, it's, it's in the book. Um, it is in the book. Um, it, and, it, and it goes back from well before St. Augustine, of course. Um, it's an issue of proportionality. Um, how you contain war, just cause, all of these still influence the way we think about war a lot. Um, uh, Neri mentioned the sort of five tests that appeared in the Chicago speech in 99. Um, you know, uh, are we sure of our case? Arguably from that, but certainly um, uh, have we exhausted the diplomatic means. I mean, it all, it all, it's within that tradition. I think one of the challenges for the tradition, uh, which you know, it has uh, just cause, just means, um, is that uh, the just means uh, are difficult. You don't know when you start. If you, if you, you start a war and say, you know, we're going to fight this in, in the just, most just way possible and with proportionality. Um, it doesn't work, and I spent some time looking 
at uh, the attempts to contain war in the 19th century through international law, um, which suffered because in the end there was always a way out and it was called military necessity. Uh, so if you were, if you argued, um, you could argue that uh, prisoners uh, should, should be taken and given proper rights, the injured should be looked after, non-combatants could be spared, unless military necessity uh, made that impossible. Uh, and that sort of way out became more and more uh, uh, developed, particularly with air power, because a lot of the just war theory worked better on the ground than it did from the air. So it's a very important um, uh, and powerful normative framework, which is still, which is still there, but uh, has been a challenge to, to apply. And over time, obviously, not so well. I mean, and you look, look at the civil wars, uh, ignored all the time. Look at Syria, ignored all the time. Um, so th thanks for this uh, reflection. It's, it's very interesting. Um, if, if you think about the two, um, the two themes with which you concluded, um, the, the preoccupation with surprise attack um, and the, the concern with civilians and how, how one deals with civilians and their possibility of opposition, those are both problems, if you like, of military strategy. And so I wonder if you think um, back to the different ways that you could make wrong predictions. You could have a wrong theory of international relations. You could have a wrong theory of domestic politics. You could have a wrong theory of um, technological change uh, or, or, or wrong you know, understanding of technological change. Or you could have the problem in, in military strategy. And you focused really on the fourth. Are there characteristic ways, when you think about people's predictions of the future of war, that the other ways of thinking make errors? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I, I did, you're, you're, you're correct. Um, and of course, you know, you're opening up a very large subject. The theory, the theories of international relations are obviously pretty important uh, in the book um, because uh, if you believe it's all structural imperatives, you come out with one set of conclusions. If you believe that economic interdependence makes all the difference, you come out with another set of conclusions. Um, if you believe it's all dependent on the quality of decision makers, yet more. So, um, and it, if you look, um, the, the peace movement, which again features quite large in the book, um, in the 19th century uh, and into the early 20th century, basically assumed that war was irrational, um, that it was pushed by nationalism and. Uh, outdated notions of sovereignty, and that you've had to find some way of overcoming them. Um, a very straightforward theory. And it kept on being disappointed uh, because uh, it, it, the theory may have been correct, but people kept on behaving in their view irrationally. Um, the things I quote is a, is, a, is a book that was written in in thirty three, um, uh, about uh, edited by Leonard Wolf, an intelligent man's guide to ending war. Um, in which there's a lot of essays, including one by Norman Angel, about, the, uh, about how to stop one. All the way through, you've got these occasional references to Herr Hitler. Um, I'm wondering, is he going to be sort of tamed um, by the responsibilities of power, or does he mean what he, say, what he says? So, you know, the, so you can see the challenges to the theories are all the way through. Just a final point. Um, when I looked at civil, the, the sort of stuff on civil wars, um, one of the things that interested me a lot was the role of IR theory, in particular quantification, uh, the quantitative approach. Um, so one of the things I did was actually look at the databases, which of course, given this is the basis of the, of the scientific approach for international relations, <laughs> suffers from the fact that the databases are totally unreliable. Um, because a lot of the time we just don't know. We don't know how many people died in particular <laughs> wars. Uh, classifying them is, is very hard. So th there's another sense there in, in which uh, bad theory doesn't help. You know, I mentioned the democratic peace idea. Democratic peace seems to be an example of very bad theory, um, extrapolating from the experience of Western Europe after the Second World War and assuming that that would work everywhere and every place, and almost as soon as it was promulgated uh, as a basis for Western policy, and it sounded really good and nice, fell apart, and particularly in the Balkans. So, you know, I, th I think 
uh, bad theory of all sorts is, is an important part of the story. Great. Other questions? So I just wanted to flip the thesis, if I may, of the future of a non-war state, I mean non-war situation, not peace, and in two different cases, a failed or dissolving state, yeah. failed state, and a traditional, say, Ukraine. The, the solution that has been always advocated is capacity building. Okay. So the next step of that is then generally focus on Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior. Generally speaking, though, there are reasons why the states are dissolving that are political and, and other grievances. What are the dangers for Western or donor states to focus just on the interior and Ministry of Defense and they create more of an imbalance without the remedy of going deeper into the society to see the balance between in the army and so forth? The other one is, let's take the Ukraine example, and nation state to nation state deterrence has been effective. So one could say, well, why don't we make Ukraine a NATO member? Well, pretty soon you're, you're writing insurance policies that your premiums are not being covered, are co going to cover that. You reach your tipping, a tipping point, and then if it's on credibility, then you just need one incident, one time, where you can't cash the check. How should, in a constrained budget environment for the donor nations and political populist movement, how should policymakers balance those two forces? Well, two, two questions in. <laughs> two, two, uh, two very big questions, which you've set out very clearly, and I don't disagree at all with how you've set them out. Let's take the first one. Uh, so the problem we have is that, um, and so it became the approach to counterinsurgency. So the correct proposition that uh, insurgencies happen for a reason. Um, they represent, in some ways, a failure of the, uh, of the government, which are, are facing a problem with which they apparently can't cope without our help. If we, if we try to help them, um, there's no point unless we address the issues that cause the problem in the first place. Um, but wars are very bad times to do that. Uh, so you end up having to deal with the interior ministries and the ministries of defense, which if you take the Iraq case, hasn't been a particularly happy experience. Um, without addressing the bigger issues of reform. But foreign armies are not particularly good instruments of addressing those big issues of reform. So the conclusion you come to is that it's very hard to intervene unless you have a political movement, indigenous, with whom you can work and who has the competence and capacity um, to introduce these reforms. And in societies and governments which have failed, that can be quite a tall order. So often what you end up with is a strong man, almost inevitably man, uh, say Sisi, you know, because uh, that's the only one who seems to have any hope of holding things together. But you know at that very moment that the sort of issues that have been, uh, that have caused a problem in the first place uh, are likely to revive. So it's a depressing prospect. Uh, and one reason why it, you know, the only way around it is, uh, is the long haul. I mean, it is a heck of a long effort. Uh, doing, hoping that you've contained um, the insurgencies or the trouble um, and showing palpable pro progress. But it's very, just to take the example of Iraq, um, you know, the, the British um, paid very little attention, actually, to, to southern Iraq while they were there. Um, decided that the place was stable so long as nobody was shooting at them. Um, and, uh, when it, and as far as leaving was going, um, it had conditions. And the conditions were that the Iraqi police and army had to be able to take over. But of course, they never were able to take over. So we left anyway. Um, and you know, the, the, then uh, it was, the situation was rescued because the Americans and the Baghdad came in to sort it out. But it, it wasn't a durable uh, position. So, uh, so that's the first question. I mean, you're, you're right, but we're left with just dilemmas. If you leave it all alone and say, well, this is all too hopeless and any intervention is going to make it, uh, it's not going to solve anything, then, you know, you, we can give you plenty of examples of countries which have just gone to complete rack and ruin because nobody's tried to talk. It's, it's, a, it's a real set of dilemmas. It's best put as dilemmas. There's no solution here. 
there are dilemmas, and, and you're trying to work your way through them. On the second question of of, um, of offering alliance, um, it, again, it's tricky. After, I mean, my view in the 1990s, early 1990s, was NATO's partnership for peace was a good idea. Um, it, it had a lot of flexibility in the relations with the Central and Eastern European countries, um, without being provocative in terms of you know, pushing NATO east. But, you know, you talk to Czechs and Hungarians and Poles and so on, and they didn't want it, they, 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 you know, because, you know, you, 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 you've left us to cope against the Germans, you left us to cope against uh, the Soviets. Isn't it about time you gave us a bit of security? And it was a pretty hard argument uh, to, uh, to deal with. And then gradually over time, uh, as you acquired more allies, and with real benefits, I mean, I think, you know, the expansion of the EU and NATO, uh, it, I mean, it, the nationalist push against this now, but I mean, it brought real benefits to Poland and Hungary and Czechs and so on, um, and being challenged now in those countries. Um, but it, you're getting closer and closer to Russia all the time, you get to the Baltic states, uh, and, and, you're, and as we're seeing now, you're, you're, you're acquiring liabilities. <clears throat> Uh, but what are you going to do? Because you, so you don't take it into Ukraine. It was raised in 2008, um, and uh, with, with Ukraine and Georgia. And the next thing we know, Georgia's being invaded by the Russians, with the, Ukraine, with the Georgians giving them a pretext. Um, and so we, you know, we don't do very much about it, and the, and the issue is dropped. But the Ukrainians, when you talk to them, say, "Yeah, it's fine being a buffer state. We, we just get buffeted." Um, and uh, again, you've got a dilemma, uh, the, 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 the result. So I don't think the issue is to offer Ukraine membership of NATO at the moment, which would be uber provocative. Um, but uh, and I actually think the way that we've handled Ukraine over the last couple of years, having not handled it particularly well before, is not bad. I think we've found probably the right mix of policies if we can sustain them, which is why the thing is sort of at a stalemate rather than still desperately dynamic. But, it, but it's an issue if you, and it's not dissimilar to your first question, if you disclaim responsibility, then you can't be surprised if things get worse. If you accept responsibility, then uh, you're involved in some pretty challenging policy and operational questions. Another question, yeah. Just uh, leading uh, straight on from that about provocation, uh, NATO has deployed several thousand troops to Eastern Europe recently, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland. Um, is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? Um, is it going to achieve its aim, do you think? I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, a reasonable idea that these countries are now, you know, whether, whether they should have been or not, they probably, uh, given their history from 1939, um, uh, if, you, if they're allies, then you have a responsibility. Um, they felt vulnerable. I think it's probably been a helpful reminder to Putin, um, which I think he always had, that uh, what in a, taking on an, an ally, a member of NATO, is a much bigger deal than taking on a non-member of NATO. I think he understands that, and he's acted that way uh, when he's try to put pressure on NATO members, um, it's, it's economic or cyber with Estonia, say, in 2007, but it's not, it's not military in the way as with Ukraine. So I think it's fine. I mean, I don't think it's, um, you know, you, you have to, it's measured, it's not, it's, not, it's not an offensive capability being placed on, 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 uh, in these countries. No, no. Laurie, you described a sort of 10-year lag between what academics write and, you know, what's actually happened. But is there a bit of a lag, perhaps even more than 10 years, at the moment between Britain as a military power and the decline of that, if we look at military budgets and we look at what the heads of each part of Britain's military tell us, which is that they've been shrunk beyond recognition... Yeah. And what the politicians sit in Westminster talking about, the deployment of British military power, Britain and its global strategy. I mean, 
does it look out of kilter to you, or are the, are the military exaggerating and uh, the politicians overstating? Well, I was about to say what people thought 10 years ago was different to how they think of things now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, look, well, there's a budget, um, and there's an awful lot of uh, leaking and so on been going on before a budget, which is always going to paint the state of the armed forces and, as being dire uh, and historic capabilities under threat and so on. Um, so I don't think it's as bad uh, as is said, but it's not good. And the problem is uh, a particular decision, which was to go for very big carriers, uh, which uh, have distorted the defence budget. Um, inevitably, they turn out to be expensive. You've got to think about protecting them, and you've got to think about buying things to put on them, which, again, we've gone for the most expensive option. So, um, Why is that? Why, why? I mean, I go down to Portsmouth regularly. Huge, unbelievably expensive aircraft carrier sitting there with nothing on it. Yes. So, so what's the deal? Is this corruption? Um, I think that's putting it too high. I think it's, uh, I mean... It's almost corruption. Well, it's, it's, it's politics, Rosyth. Um, you know, this is a story that goes back to the Defence Review of 1997-8. Um, it started with a perfectly reasonable proposition that if we're going to get involved in more expeditionary warfare, you need to take your air base with you. Um, if you're not fighting a great power war, then your uh, floating air base doesn't have to be as protected uh, as it might have been in the Second World War or with previous generations of carriers. Um, and if you continued that thought, you would have looked at one of the most successful uh, ships of, of recent times, HMS Ocean, which is a converted container ship, which has done sterling service, not that expensive, which carries helicopters and all sorts of stuff around. Um, uh, and it's quite cheap. And you have a, a number of those. Uh, but instead, we go, what we would call the sort of the Death Star um, uh, approach, which is you put vast amounts of money into this amazing, I mean, it is amazing uh, kit, which may do great things, but it's going to take an awfully long time before we're going to get the full value out of it, just simply because of the time it'll take to get the F-35s and helicopters uh, to put on it. And then you realise, well, if you're going to, you know, the Americans want to take us into Asia Pacific, uh, well, you better have some escorts if you're doing that. Uh, and the idea that this great thing, I mean, it's called a Death Star thing, because those of you who know your Star Wars will, will, will know the Death Star uh, was this amazing thing that the, the, the Jedi built. Um, which had one design flaw, uh, which, of course, Luke Skywalker and his genius managed to find. Actually, they were told about it, if you follow this story very carefully, um, which meant that this great big contraption, um, which had taken all the energies of the, um, of the evil empire to build, uh, could be blown up by somebody just finding the one weakness. And that idea uh, uh, is, um, is scary. I mean, for, for if you're a British defence, our new British defence minister, uh, brand new, our brand new British defence minister, who's not as far as one can see dealt with these issues before, is go is going to have to wrestle with some big questions. Mm -hmm. So I think that I think there's a problem, there's a particular problem in, in decisions that were made. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's different from the Trident decision because you can argue about whether Britain should be a nuclear power. But at least Trident is based on systems that we know and understand, where we've got the infrastructure for, and so on. Uh, and you know, that, uh, whereas the, the carriers have uh, screwed, you know, distorted the whole effort. Can I can I ask one last question, Laurie? Sorry, actually, you throw in yours, and I'll throw in mine, and then we'll we'll end. <laughs> I was going to ask whether you think. The West, NATO, this government, our military are prepared for future threats, whether we're ready for them. And how long do you think that the government's current fear of boots on the ground, of lives at risk, will last? Because, frankly, now I feel that 
anything could happen in the world and the government wouldn't do anything about it in case someone might die. Brilliant, because, I mean, that, that was basically my question. Can the West be strategic? You talked about China showing a different way. It was said after Syria that Syria showed that for Putin, force is used as part of a strategy, and for the West, force is used when they don't have a strategy. And it, and it did pose a question of... Can these democracies that we live in with, with seemingly unstable governments actually have military strategy? Well, they can. Um, and I would, you know, I'm not sure Putin is that brilliant. Uh, I, th I think his Ukraine strategy is, is a failure, uh, given what he wanted to achieve. And his Syrian strategy has been much more successful, but has landed him with the sort of problems we were talking about before, which is uh, the, the risk, I mean, Assad is not running a, a country uh, in any obvious way. How, how that is put together again, how reconstruction happens, it's a lot of Russia's problem. And uh, you know, for whether Putin's been that brilliant is another question. Uh, of course, means you acquire liabilities, and he's acquired them. Uh, the boots on the ground issue, it's not a new issue. It was there in the 90s. Remember, America, the United States did not want to put forces into Bosnia, did not want to put forces into Kosovo for precisely those sort of reasons. The British were more prepared, the French were more prepared to do so. But there were, you know, there were limits on what they could do by themselves. So it's not a new issue. Even with Afghanistan, even after 9-11, the Americans um, wanted to do it with the Northern Alliance and so on, rather than put a massive American force in to defeat the Taliban. And even with Iraq, Rumsfeld was boasting about how small the American force, it was sufficient to defeat the Iraqis, but quite inadequate to provide law and order once the regime was toppled. So you, if you don't put so-called boots on the ground, basically infantry in, um, then given that you know, war is a political struggle. It's about, uh, and largely, it's about who uh, who occupies territory and, and who prevails in that territory. And if you don't have a physical presence, you're not part of the struggle. You can help somebody else who's part of the struggle by providing their air power or their air, air cover, but you're not part of the struggle yourself. And that's, uh, uh, and that's again, another part of this same set of dilemmas of being... Um, uh, of trying to limit your liabilities all the way through, yet have very ambitious effects. Uh, and, and it is a strategic problem in the end because you're trying to, you, you can't in the end do it. If you, if you want to have ambitious effects, you've got to be prepared to put a lot of force in. And most of the world's problems, uh, of, of the issues, we're not prepared to do that. And I don't think we're, we're likely to. We'll support others. Um, we'll encourage you know, African states to get involved in the challenges of sub-Saharan Africa and so on. Um, but none of them are going to be uh, elegant solutions, um, but they may manage things, contain them for a bit, and then we hope over time uh, other things will take, will take over and it'll all get a little easier. The, so the issue only becomes one where something so big and so critical to our national interests is taking place. Um, that we have no choice but to sort of get a grip on a particular country. Um, and that could happen. It could happen in North Africa. Uh, it could happen... Uh, it, it, it could still potentially happen uh, around the periphery of, the, of Russia, though I, I'm less worried about that than one might have been. Uh, but that's the sort of thing, situation we're talking about. I don't... Um, We'll have advisory missions. We'll have, you know, there's lots of things you can do um, in which you're providing a bit of support, as was done in the fight against ISIS, the special forces. But the, the idea of a large expeditionary force going to sort out another civil war, I think, is, 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 is far less likely. And it just may have been a period from the mid-90s uh, until decade ago that we were prepared to do that. Remember, in 1990, 
the assumption was, in line with the Charter of the UN, that you did not intervene in the internal affairs of other states. Uh, and and the, you know, this was not the sort of thing that we did. That was the view with which the Bush senior administration viewed um, both the Gulf, um, you know, the aftermath of the Gulf conflict, when the, Kurd, the Kurdish crisis, and Bosnia and, and, and Croatia. Um, because they were actually in the middle of Europe, it was hard to ignore them. So we did get involved. Um, but if they're, if they're far away, yes, sir. Well, you, you intervened to keep them on your side of the Cold War. Well, no, we, 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 there were, the, the interventions during the Cold War um, were by and large um, to support, were proxies. Yes. Uh, uh, they, they, they were proxies. And, um, but you were never getting the same, I mean, they were with arms sales and so on. On the occasions like Vietnam, where you, you, you went in in, in force, they, they weren't an encouraging um, uh, example in terms of uh, what you might do in the future because it exemplified all, all the problems uh, that, that came running back in, in the, uh, after, you, after the invasion of Iraq. Brilliant. Before I enjoy, uh, invite you to join me to thank um, Professor Laurie Friedman, can I just mention, he mentioned Graham Allison's book, The Thucydides Trap, controversial book about the rise of China. So let me all invite you back on Wednesday, the 29th of November, where, when we will have Graham Allison here with um, Kevin Rudge, the former Australian Prime Minister, and Todd Hall to debate uh, the provocative aspects of his argument about the rise of China. So you're most welcome to join us. That's Wednesday the 29th of November at 5.30. Um, much more importantly at this moment, Laurie, just a huge thank you for us all um, for just a fascinating reminder of why we need to look at history, why we need to look at scholarship, why we need to apply your five principles about whether we should be going to war at all. Thank you. <laughs>